What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Kirsten Potenza, CEO and founder of Pound the Rockout Workout. You're listening to The Big Green Couch, where I sit down with noisemakers across various industries to discuss different topics, to bring new ideas, fresh perspectives, and practical tips to you, our community. Let's get started. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of The Big Green Couch. Today, we have a super inspirational guest, Ashley Wisdom. So Ashley is an experienced public health professional. She is the founder and CEO of Health in Her Hue, a digital platform that connects Black women to culturally competent healthcare providers, services, as well as health content. Health in Her Hue's mission is to reduce racial health disparities by leveraging the power of technology, media, and community to improve health outcomes for Black women. As a public health professional, Ashley is a champion for health equity and is passionate about taking an equitable approach to healthcare innovation. She received her BS from Howard University and her Master of Public Health with a focus in healthcare policy and management from NYU. Given her public health expertise and experience working closely with strategic investors, she has a unique perspective and a keen insight on healthcare technology and innovation. Ashley was recently selected to give a TEDx talk titled, How Healthcare Failures Fuel Innovation. Her app was also recently endorsed by Serena Williams when she chose it as a cause for her nonprofit, Vital Voices, which invests in women leaders who drive global change. Welcome, Ashley. I'm so excited to have you with us today. Um, It's been a while since I've had a face-to-face big green couch and um, virtual scenarios are are just as good I found. So thank you for being here. Before we begin the conversation, I I always kind of like to ask how how are you? <laughs> how is your your heart? I know that this um this year has been one for the books for for most of the humans around the world. So just a, a check-in we'll begin with. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, today I am feeling pretty, you know, good. I, I've been, 2020 has taught me literally to take every day, um, one day at a time. And I feel like that was um, a bit of a cliche back in the day, but now that's literally what I do. And so today I woke up, got on my Peloton, worked out, felt good, took care of myself and then got to work. So I'm in a good headspace. and um, all things considered, I really can't complain. Thank you for asking. I love it. Who what whose classes do you take on Peloton? So I love Tunde and um and is Allie Love? I think yeah. I'm getting her name. Yeah, and I love Al- Allie. And Alex like kicks my butt, so I like taking his classes too. <laughs> is Alex the one okay, I should say that I don't have a Peloton bike, but I, I know um of a lot of the instructors. I feel like Alex is the one that my sister's husband takes. She says that he sounds like Vince Vaughn. <laughs> Is that yeah. Alex? Yeah. That sounds, I think he was like in the military and so he like takes that <laughs> approach. So yeah, that sounds like him. <laughs> That's amazing. She's like, I wake up to Vince Vaughn every morning at 6 a.m. <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm happy to hear that. And I, I'm also happy to hear just, I feel like there's been so many silver linings with, with COVID and, and the way that we um, view our lives and prioritize um, our lives. Um, and I hope that some of those things stick as we move into whatever the future looks like. Um, mm-hmm. So I always kind of like to go back to the beginning. Uh, I'd love for you to share with our community a little bit more about yourself. You know, where did you grow up? What was your upbringing like? And, and what really led you to a career in public health care? Oh, well, okay, where do I start? So I <laughs> <laughs> so do you gotta go do we want to go way way back um well I was born in the Bahamas which is pretty random um but my mom is Jamaican and uh, my family made a pit stop in the Bahamas before migrating to the United States and so my mom had me while I was in the Bahamas uh we moved to the states to New York when I was eight months old so I'm pretty much American um mm-hmm. but still closely tied to my West Indian and Caribbean roots 
we I grew up in New York, um, in Westchester primarily. And then when I was in like fifth grade, we moved to the Bronx. So we moved to New York City and I spent my formative years growing up in the Bronx. Um, the Bronx doesn't have the best reputation, but the Bronx, um, it really made me, you know, made me the woman that I am today. Mm. Grew up in the church. My stepfather is the minister of music in the church. My mom sings in the choir. My siblings are all very musically inclined. I am not <laughs> musically inclined, but I'm creative in a very different way. Um, so yeah, so I grew up in a very close-knit family, family that's really rooted in, in uh, Christian faith. So, um, you know, that's what really grounds me in, in the way that I move through the world. Um, my Again, my family is a family of immigrants, so very humble beginnings, but, you know, came to the United States to pursue the American dream, as most immigrants do. And I've seen what really hard work um, can do, like working beyond despite the odds and really just being clear about what you're trying to accomplish and sticking to that. I've seen all the women and even the men in my family do that. And so that definitely played a significant role in the way that I move and I work. Uh, I was interested, I became interested in healthcare because most of the women in my family were either caretakers or um, eventually moved on into the healthcare field. So again, started from very humble beginnings. My mom used to babysit in Westchester County before um, moving on to, to work with, um, she's now a, a certified nurse's assistant. And um, she used to work for people with mental um, disabilities. So I've always been around women and family members who are either nurses or just working in some kind of caregiving healthcare type role. Um, I was when I was in high school, I started saying that I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a pediatrician. And that's like every West Indian parent's dream, like your child, should be a doctor or a lawyer. So you know that they're going to be secure and that you coming to this country was like the best thing you did for them. Um, so I was pre med, I went to Howard University for undergrad, uh, was pre med there recognized pretty soon that Medical school is really not what I wanted to do. I was pursuing that doctor wisdom because I knew it would make my family proud. And I knew that it would lead to a secure job, probably lots of debt, but a secure job nonetheless. Um, but it was when I took uh, organic chemistry that I really had a come to Jesus moment. And I recognized, I was like, look, I can pass this class. Like, I'm smart enough to do this, but I've done enough internships and I've worked in enough hospitals to recognize that I'm really like working with patients in a you know clinical setting is really not my it's not what makes me go, and I, I really had to wrestle with myself and and say like do you really want to spend the next four or five years after undergrad pursuing a degree just because the title and the prestige that comes with it, but not because that's really what you feel you're called to do on this earth. Um, so I had that moment. I remember sitting down outside of the chem building and calling my mom and telling her, look, I'm going to change my major. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not going to go to medical school, but I'm not going to be a bio major because there's nothing else I would want to do with biology, with a biology degree if I decide not to go to medical school. So I started making, I made that pivot early on. It was hard to have that conversation with my mom, but it was one of the best decisions that I made um, for myself and on, honestly for my family too. So I consider, I continued being pre-med and undergrad. And um, once I graduated, I got a job as a grant writer for a community health center and community community health centers are basically health centers that work are that provide free health care to people free or discounted or affordable health care to people who either don't have insurance or are underinsured and that job really opened my eyes to the the basically how inequitable our health care system is mm -hmm. and also exposed me to this other side of healthcare, which was this public health and business side and policy side of healthcare. So it was like, this is more my speed. Like I'm into politics, I'm into social justice, and I really do love healthcare. I love the industry, but I just knew that being a clinician or nurse or doctor wasn't really my thing. And so that I'm so grateful for that job because that job opened my eyes to that other side of healthcare that was more my speed. And because of that job, I ended up uh, applying to grad school and pursuing my master's of public health. And I started off at one school, but didn't have the best experience there with the Jew and then um, applied to NYU, which is actually the school I wanted to go to to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to, um, to get my master's of public health, that first job out of undergrad. That, that's an incredible story. And I want to go back to the, the pivot that you mentioned. I, 
I think I think that that so many people have a similar story to that. I, I and I visually remember mine and I also was I was in my, you know, apartment in college and I, I called my parents and it, and I remember the one of the greatest pep talks that I received from my father, but it's that pivot that I think shouldn't go unnoticed and and I want to just talk about it for a second because as young kids in, in the United States, there's always a pressure to be something that you think your parents uh, want and you and you want to make your parents proud. And then I know how much kids struggle with this. Um, they always have and they still do today. What was it, do you think, in you that gave you, felt, made you feel empowered enough to actually be able to pivot? Because that's not a small feat. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I want to kind of highlight that because it's hard to do what, what you did and it led you to, I, I would imagine, a much happier and more fulfilled place. Where do you think that kind of power and that confidence came from? That's it's interesting because I, I often go back to that moment. That it's, this question you're asking me, it's, I go back to that moment a lot um, and I'm like, something turned on um, with me at that moment, like, you know, when you're 18, 19, you're a teenager, you're always relying on your parents or your teachers or the guardians in your life to kind of lead you into what's the next thing you should be doing. And so I realized that I fell into that trap that like my family just hooked on to this one thing that aligns with what they wanted for my life. And it just mm-hmm. happened to come out of my mouth. And I really had to sit down. Like college was really that time where I, I had to come into myself. I grew up pretty sheltered. Um, and I'm grateful for that for many reasons, but I grew up pretty sheltered. And I realized like, I'm not going to have my parents. um, They're not going to be the ones that have to live my life. Like, and I Mm -hmm. want my parents around, I want my family around for a long time so that they can see me through the different seasons of life. But the reality is when they're no longer here and, and it's just me, like I have to live with the life that I'm living. And so I need to make sure that I'm happy about the decisions that I'm making and the choices I'm making so that my life will look like what I want it to look like. And when I really sat down and thought about that, I knew that I was only pursuing a medical degree for superficial reasons. And that was not going to be enough to keep me through the ups and downs of medical school. Like I was very clear on that. Like this is going to be a very difficult and long journey. And if I'm only pursuing it for superficial reasons, I'm going to be absolutely miserable and everyone around me is going to be miserable. And so, and that just was not the life that I wanted for myself. And so that's what allowed me to really get the courage to call my mom and say, look, this is the, the decision that I'm making here, are the implications. I might have to spend an extra year here at Howard, but this is what I need to do for myself. Yeah, I think that's I think that's incredible. And it takes it takes a lot to really be courageous enough to make that decision. It doesn't sound like it in the scheme of things in you know, you're you're in college, but it's huge and it's life changing. Um and it's it's amazing to hear stories like that. So Ashley, you recently created a platform called Health in Her Hue, which we will get into in a in a moment later on in the conversation. But first, I want to talk about the history and the story that sits behind the need for an app and a platform like the one you created. A July 16, 2020 Pop Sugar Fitness article written about you and your business stated the following. The historical and modern day distrust of the medical system in the black community stems from centuries of medical malpractice, misdiagnosis, and undertreatment at the hands of white professionals in medicine. All one has to do is search the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or the coerced sterilization spurred by the eugenics movement with the aim of controlling quote unquote undesirable populations of immigrants, disabled, mentally ill, and people of color, preventing them from having children to understand the deep rooted mistrust. Can you shed some light on the history of racial disparities in our healthcare system and the issues that black women and men face because of it? Yes, I mean, the the unfortunate thing in reality is that the U.S. healthcare system was built 
on the backs, on, you know, built on the backs of Black women. Um, if you look at Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks, her cells were used um, for stem cell or for, for research and are still being used to, to this day. And her family, she was never compensated. Her family was never compensated. You have stories like Marion Sims, who's, you know, deemed the father of modern gynecology and the experimentation that he did on Black women's bodies to, to come up with some of the um, advances that we benefit from now in gynecology, um, those things were done on Black women without their consent and at times was lethal and very painful for them. And so that is the relationship with Black bodies and the healthcare system. That is the relationship or that's the foundation of the U.S. healthcare system. That's how we've been able to make advances um, in science. And it's been at the expense of Black women and men um, their health and their lives. And so without addressing that, without acknowledging that, and just kind of like moving along with life and moving along with the advances that we see in, in science, they're not, there are advances and things like that that are happening, but, um, you know, Black men and Black women are not benefiting from um, a healthcare system that has not yet really grappled with or addressed the systemic racism that's embedded in the system in, in, in itself. And so there, you mentioned the Tuskegee study, there's a lot of distrust between um, Black people and clinical trials and research because of that, because we were, um, you know, scientists withheld treatment from, from yep. people just to see like how syphilis was going to, what it was going to do to, to their bodies until this day, people have a lot of skepticism. Like right now, you know, we have the COVID vaccine trials that are beginning and I'm seeing a lot of intentional marketing towards getting black um, and brown people to, to join the trials. And I get it. We're the ones that are being disproportionately affected. And so we need to be included in the research. But there's that historical reason why people are apprehensive. We don't trust the U.S. health care system. We don't trust the government with our bodies. And so that's the that's the foundation of like our relationship with healthcare. And then, um, you know, without boring <laughs> you and the audience with all the stats, we see a lot of healthcare disparities this day that health outcomes for Black women are significantly worse compared to our white peers, and the same thing exists for Black men. Um, and that all stems from the systemic racism that's embedded in our healthcare system and then our society at large, like black women are less likely to have insurance. And if you don't have insurance, you're probably not going to get your preventative care um, visits as frequently as you should because you can't afford those out of pocket pay um, fees. Black women are more likely to be obese and have diabetes. But before we stop and think about our, you know, it's easy to for people to to blame black women and say, what are they doing? Are they genetically predisposed to, to diabetes? And there's a little bit of that, yes. Um, but we also have to think about the context in which black and brown people live. If you live in a neighborhood that is not being, mm -hmm. you know, it's been economically um, ignored and, and um, just not invested in, you, you're probably living in a neighborhood yeah. that's probably yeah. riddled with crime and you're not going out for a light jog if, um, <laughs> if it's not safe. And so all those things play a role in, in the way that our, our health outcomes uh, manifest. And so, that's a bit of the the background. I, I don't want to get too much on my my public health soapbox, but that's first of all, um, stats are never boring because they're facts, <laughs> and that's that that tells the story, right? When you when you when you look at the the facts and the stats, it it tells a very mm -hmm. very clear story. And I I do I would like you to talk about it more because I know the first time that it was brought to my attention was only. Two or three years ago when I was listening um, to an NPR segment. And before that, I had no clue. Um, and I w it wouldn't have been brought to my attention otherwise. So please d do share more um, because I think it's something that many people aren't aware of and that they, they need to be aware of. I would be happy to hear more. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll dive into some of the stats because one of the questions I get a lot of times with Health at Q um, is why are you focusing on black women? And, mm -hmm. you know, the platform is going to be available and marketed towards women of color generally. But when I started off, I was very intentional about saying this platform is for black women because 
when I was studying in grad school, I saw the statistics and it was like every outcome, black women were like at the lowest end, like the outcomes were dismal. So we're high, we have a higher incidence of heart disease compared to white women. Um, For black women, it's 7.6%. And for white women, it's only 5.8%. So you see the difference there. For obesity, um, black women, they're 56 0.9% 0.9% of us um, are, us who are 20 years or older are obese. Uh, we have lower incidence of getting breast cancer, but when compared to white women, but when we do get breast cancer, um, we're more likely to die from it. And that's oftentimes because we go, we get screens later. And by the time we get screened and it's caught where it's a later stage of breast cancer. And so those are just a couple of stats. Um, I, one of the one more that I'll mm-hmm. throw out is I think it's probably the most commonly heard is the maternal mortality crisis that we're that we're experiencing. Women generally are be, are experiencing this, but Black women are being hit harder. Yeah. They were three to four times likely um, more likely to die from a pregnancy related complication compared to our white peers. Like that is frightening. And I remember reading a paper for class and literally crying. I was in my bed like 11 o'clock at night reading a paper and crying because I was just like, wow, I did not know that it was like this bad. I didn't know, like, I didn't really even understand the complexity yep. of how systemic racism yeah. impa- impacts our bodies physically, you know, physically. And so that's what, that was the impetus for me creating this platform and, and naming black women. Yeah. That, that, that's what the segment was about specifically childbirth and, and the, the lack of of trust and it was beyond um, upsetting to to listen to, but it it needs to be uh, talked about so that more people are aware of it. So with with health in her hue, the the platform that you created, which like you said, probably what phase one connecting Black women to healthcare resources. Um, that are committed to their health and well-being, but there's also a, a lot more than that that you provide. Um, can you tell the community more about the platform just in general and the mission behind it and what really inspired you um, to start it and, and how it works? Yeah, so, um, you know, the platform, it's uh, the primary purpose is to connect Black women to culturally competent healthcare providers content, like health content that really speaks to Black women's lived experiences. And then we're also moving towards offering telehealth services through our platform. So if you can't find a Black doctor, let's say you live in Wisconsin or New Hampshire, and there aren't many Black doctors um, physically located near you, you'd be able to use Health and Hue to consult with a Black doctor or doctor of color um, who, you know, who you probably feel more comfortable getting a second opinion from and things of that nature. And so I created the platform because, again, I I mentioned that at moment of just being in my bed and thinking and feeling so burdened by the statistics. Mm-hmm. And I remember hearing someone say that, like, if you feel overwhelmingly burdened by a problem, then chances are you're probably uniquely positioned mm-hmm. to address it. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm like literally in bed crying <laughs> about this stuff. What can I do to make other Black women aware of how dire and in, in this situation is for us, that we really need to be intentional about vetting our providers, whether they're black or white, and that we really need to be um, better and smarter consumers of healthcare. Because unfortunately, our country treats healthcare as a commodity and not a right. And so since we're consumers of healthcare, we should be making our choices Mm -hmm. around selecting a healthcare provider with, you know, feeling empowered. And so the first piece of that was, how can I take this information out of the ivory tower, out of these academic institutions and make it relevant and accessible to your everyday Black woman who's not going to understand academic jargon? And so I started leveraging social media and leveraging my network of health care professionals who are Black to write evidence-based content. And that's how we were able to build an audience and a following and a community. And then I always knew that I wanted to build out this technology component that made it easier for Black women to find Black or culturally competent healthcare providers on a digital platform. So I love ZocDoc. I've used ZocDoc to find amazing doctors and therapists, but I had to search so long and hard to find a doctor who looks like me and to find a therapist who looks like me on psychology today. And I thought, why is it so complicated? Like, why is, why do black and brown people have to like tap into their black alumni network um, to find referrals for black healthcare providers? Like, why can't I just go online and easily find 
black and brown healthcare providers if that's my preference. And none of these websites had a filter for race. Yeah. And yeah. I, in some ways I can get why there's probably some hesitation and trepidation around doing that. But I also know that like constantly, like at least once a week, my Howard alumni New York network, everyone's sending emails like, hey, can I get a referral to a black dermatologist in Brooklyn and Manhattan? Absolutely. So there was clearly a need for us to find providers who we feel more comfortable with and do that online versus having to like rely on our, our personal networks. And so that's what gave me the idea to create um, this database of black and brown healthcare providers so that black women could easily find providers who they just because of the cultural yep. connection that they are probably more likely to trust. And that's like half the battle. You know, you find someone who looks like you, you feel comfortable. Now you probably go and do some more due diligence and figure out where they went to school. Do they take your insurance? But we at least wanted to make that connection piece a bit more easier. Um, our platform is still in the very early stages, but as we grow and evolve, um, we want to make sure that the providers we have listed aren't just black and brown, but they're actually culturally competent. Because just because you're black and brown doesn't mean you don't have biases. Right, because there's there's so many layers of issues yeah, here. One, yeah. the lower percentage of, of black and people of color who are in the positions, and then also the people who are culturally competent and aware right. um who you would feel safe with how i mean i imagine that is a very large exactly project to take on how do you how do you uh i i know you're not there yet but how are you looking to <laughs> to move into that that phase well we've been successful at is getting the buy-in. Like it's not easy to get physicians or healthcare professionals to like sign up for anything. So like that was half the battle. <laughs> and we got, we've gotten strong engagement. We have almost 800 providers, not just doctors, about 60% of the people who are listed on the platform are MDs or DOs, but we have dietitians, um, you know, therapists, lactation consultants, all of that on our platform. Uh, the next stage now is to really make sure like we've collected the NPI numbers of the doctors, their license numbers, so that we can now build out a process for how do we verify that this doctor is still, you know, their license is up to date, that they're board certified, all of that stuff. Like once we build out our technology, we want to make sure that we have a thorough vetting and verification process. And then, you know, to, to build on that cultural competency piece, can, we want to offer trainings to providers to verify and say, hey, like this provider went through implicit bias training. This provider went through this training. So they've actually been intentional about making sure that when they care for a black woman or a woman of color, that they're that they're you know, they've been trained to really be intentional about understanding her cultural and social context. And that's important. So the way that I'm thinking about it right now is. If a provider has gone through that training, we're able to that. verify that they've done that. We would have a, a little badge or something to indicate to a patient to say like, hey, this provider has gone through X training. Because at some point, you know, as, as you mentioned, there are only about five, only 5% 5 of doctors yep. in the United States are black. So the, the number of doctors is already limited and there aren't going to be those black doctors in every geographic location. And there are white doctors who are who can be equipped and who really want to be intentional about giving quality care to black women and so at some point we do want to make sure that there are white providers who have gone through the training and who are intentional about caring for black women and women of color that they can be listed and that black women can feel comfortable going to those providers because they've undergone the training and we vetted them to make sure that they're that they're capable of delivering quality care to the patients who are using our platform so that's the way that i'm envisioning it and building towards it I'm so inspired by you. <laughs> um, you. you you said something in an article that I wrote just about, and I only bring this up because it feels so relevant. Um, I am eight months pregnant and just some of the experiences that I've had at the doctor. Um, I just wanted to, to say this quote because I think it's, in its simplest form, one of the, the larger issues, you, you stated, quote, just go in there knowing that you know more about your body than a doctor who has an MD. There's that title hierarchy that we tend to feel that because this person's a doctor and they're an expert that they know more than me. And it just struck a chord because I, I know for a fact that probably everybody listening to this um, has felt that way about 
a medical experience or, or a doctor. And I almost want to mm-hmm. ask for, for your advice because what I found is that I'm a pretty outspoken person and I am a pretty confident person. So I've definitely found my voice in all of it and have felt comfortable enough to speak up for myself when I feel like things are wrong or when I feel intuitive about my own body. But how do, how would you, what advice would you give um, anybody to combat that feeling, to take the reins, if you will, when it comes to our health and, and health care? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty deep question because what I, what I was about to say also comes from a place, you know, checking my own privilege comes from a place of privilege of if you have yep. like commercial insurance, yeah, you have the choice of ch- changing your doctor if you don't like them, but not everyone has insurance or has that, you know, freedom to have um, multiple doctors that they could select from. So I want to acknowledge that privilege um, before I even say what I, what I'm about to say. Um, But I think if if you're a patient, you're a woman or or a man, or for that matter, um, and you're experiencing a doctor who's constantly discounting the concerns that you raise or the questions that you bring up, that is a clear fl- red flag that you need to try to find someone else um, or get a second opinion or try to find a friend. If you know a friend who's a doctor to say like, hey, this is what I'm experiencing is, uh, with my doctor. Is this is this normal? Um, and if you know, if you get that feedback that it's not that you should try to find someone else like. I remember hearing a podcast, um, the woman who wrote Medical Apartheid, she was asked a similar question. And one of the things that she mentioned um, and, and the advice that she gave to Black women is, one, try to tap into the human side of your your doctor, your, your physician, um, because most people go into medical, um, the medical field or healthcare want to help people. I don't know many people. I mean, there are exceptions to this rule, but I don't know many people who yeah. put themselves through medical school and all this stuff, but they didn't really want to like help people or care for people. And so she advised to like, try to tap into that human side of them and, and make sure that they understand that you need them to be a partner mm-hmm. in your health care. You don't need a dictator. You don't need someone who's just telling you what to do with your body. You need someone who's going to be a partner in care. If you don't feel like you're getting that, t- if you've gone and been intentional about trying to create that relationship with your doctor where you're a partner and they're an equal partner and they're resistant to that or they're still trying to assert this level of authority and then you just have to listen to whatever they say, then that's an indication that you might need to find someone um, someone else. But to the extent that you can try to build a relationship with your provider so that they understand that you are trying to understand your body the best um, and understand what you need to do to better, you know, better take care of yourself so that... Yeah. There's not this like authoritative, condescending approach to your care. Um, but if you're if you're dealing with a doctor who's just like, this is what I say, this is what I know, and you're asking questions yeah. to try to better understand, they should be open to explaining that to you. And if you're not getting that, then you need to speak up or if you have the opportunity to find someone else because your life literally depends on it. And that quote that I meant, you know, that I, that statement that I made in that article was real. Like we, we tend to think that we don't, you know, we hear someone with a degree tell us something about our bodies, but we've literally been with our bodies our whole life. So we know when something's off. And if you know that something's off, you should never, ever question it. You should always err on the side of caution and bring it up. Even if you think you're going a little crazy, like, I believe 100% that we know our bodies better than anyone else. And the other thing is I'm a bit empathetic to doctors because I know that many of them have limited time to see patients. Not, <laughs> And again, that speaks to some of the problems in our healthcare system, but I won't go on a soapbox on that. But there is, you know, yes, doctors are limited right. with the amount of time that they can spend with patients unless you're going to like a boutique um, practice. And so... To the extent that patients can go in knowing symptoms and bringing those and raising those concerns to the doctor or making sure that you have your questions prepared, um, if you have specific things that you want to discuss with your doctor during that visit, I think that to the extent that we can go in informed and equipped before the visit, that makes the experience so much better for us as patients and for the physician. But if you're not getting the answers that you need from your doctor, that is 100% a red flag and indication that you might need to move on to someone else. Well, therein lies the problem if you're, you know, like you said, if you're privileged enough 
um, and have a certain level of health care, you, you have the freedom to do that. And that's not always, right. that's not always the case. We, so Pound has a, a global community that, that lives and exists ar- around the world, um, probably about 50% within the United States. What can members of our community do to support change in racial disparities in our healthcare system at a micro level and at a macro level? Um, I would certainly say sharing this podcast could be one of them, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I would say like just at a micro level, just better understanding the issues at hand. Um, So if you see an article that's talking about the disparities and the inequities, I think oftentimes if if those things don't directly affect us, it's easy for us to be kind of indifferent um, and apathetic. But I think educating ourselves on the issues at hand make us not just informed, but allow us to be better um, human beings to one another and allows us to be better allies and supporters like this is the first time in my life where I've been uninsured um, because I'm going through a life transition from working full time to being an entrepreneur. And I'm like, wow, like I want to schedule my annual visit. And this is very new to me. Um, But I've also been doing the work of understanding what, like how difficult it is for people who are uninsured navigating the healthcare system. And I'm glad that it Mm -hmm. didn't take me having this personal experience to already be, you know, championing and, and looking out for those who are, you know, who deal with this um, not by choice. Um, and so I would say being informed and allows us to, to one, advocate for, for things that we otherwise wouldn't advocate for if we were ignorant to them. And then I'm, you know, I'm a policy person. And so I don't think things can really change just because of, you know, I don't think health interview, like a technology platform is going to um, really create the change that we need to see on a systemic level. Like I do believe that health interview can be, is impactful already and will continue to be impactful, but policy is really what needs to change. So on a macro level, I would say people go out and vote and vote for candidates who are really speaking to, and not just speaking to, but actually have policies and are supporting um, policies that can really change and move the needle with healthcare and, and the disparities that we see. So those are the two things that I would I would suggest the community. I love it. That I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into what, resources um, the community might uh, tap into in in a second. But first, I want to talk about something you just said. Uh, be, being an entrepreneur, uh, it's something that's so um, appealing to a lot of people these days. It's one of the more, well, probably one of the more difficult things that I've ever experienced in my life. It's, it is a, a constant, um, roller coaster and it can be very exciting and very incredible um, but it's it's always a challenge and I really do believe that every every great company started because they truly believed in solving a problem and I, I'd like to know from your perspective how in general would you advise young entrepreneurs to tap into the true and deeply embedded issues that they face and take steps to find a solution. I I get so incredibly inspired when I meet people like you and I, I just sit here wondering how did how did she do it? What was what was the first step? Where what were the tangible steps you took to create the company? And you said something earlier that was so powerful which is if you're sitting there and you feel like something needs to be changed, it usually means you're the person that can do it. Talk me through that process for you. What really got you to start? It's something I'm always really interested in, in hearing more about. And then what are tangible steps that people can take if, if they're trying to solve a problem or start a business that will solve a problem? Yeah, so I'll start with like what really did it for me because when I say like entrepreneurship is not at all in my road, my life roadmap, not at all. And like every morning I wake up, like since July, um, July is when I transitioned into just full time, um, and not, and quite frankly, not entirely voluntarily, but I'm just embracing it and leaning into it. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's been, and I know it's just the beginning of what's going to be a roller coaster of a journey. But I'm, I'm I truly believe in what I'm building, and so that's what keeps me motivated. Um, what I would in, in or let me start with the story. So I back in 2018, I was I was in grad school. I was also working for um, an academic medical center. And I, you know, the first department that I worked in, I had, you know, regular work experience, no, no drama, no issues, loved my boss. We had our moments, but it was a great working experience for the, for those two years. And then I moved to a new department and it was extremely toxic. Like the head of the, the department clearly was not a fan of black women. Um, and it trickled down to middle management and it was just, the department was a revolving door for black women, faculty members, for black women, um, staff. And it, it just was a really bad environment. And so I found myself breaking out in hives every single day. And I couldn't figure out, like, I never thought that it was stress induced because I really deal with stress really well. I'm not really someone who panics or deals with anxiety like that. But what I found out was that I was really internalizing the stress and it was manifesting physiologically through these hives. So I was going to my, going to an allergist and my allergist was a white woman and I, you know, I liked her and she was running these tests on me, couldn't figure out what was causing the hives. Like she was like, you're not really that allergic to anything for you to be breaking out in hives like this. Like this is, I don't really know what's going on. So she ended up prescribing me Allegra. She was like, take two Allegras every day just to keep them under control. And so I did that and I was like, one, buying Allegra every, like for, to take every day is pretty Mm -hmm. expensive. And two, I don't really feel comfortable just popping pills and not really identifying what's the root cause of these highs. The long and short of it was that, you know, after I left the job and finished grad school, um, the hive stopped. So I think it was a mixture of me being stressed, like working this really toxic um, environment and also doing grad school full time did not help with that situation either. And so I remember thinking to myself that, you know, with my gynecologist, who was a black woman, I talked to her about everything. I talked to her about brunch. I talked to her about what's going on in my life, my dating life, all that stuff. And she gets like a full picture of like who Ashley is as a person during that clinical visit. But with my um, allergist, and it wasn't that I didn't feel comfortable with her per se. I just never thought to mention to her what was going on with at work. And I, I know that with my gynecologist, I definitely would have brought it up because I would have assumed that she knows what it's like to be a black woman working in predominantly white spaces and dealing with microaggressions. And ha- I thought to myself, like, if I brought up my social, like what would I was dealing with at work that my allergist might have figured out like, hey, I think these highs are really stress induced and you just need to find a way to better manage stress or leave that toxic environment that you're in. So that was happening while at the same time I was learning about how our social environment really impacts our health. And I also was working at a really premier prestigious hospital system in New York City and seeing how some the leadership in that de- in the department I was working in was like blatantly prejudiced towards black women um and HR knew about it but they, she was a tenured faculty member and couldn't get her out. And I'm just like, this woman is a pediatrician and she's seeing patients. And I would hate for any black woman to bring their child to this woman. Um, so it was like my personal experience dealing with racism in a leading um, health system, learning about the social impacts, uh, social factors that impacts health, while also experiencing that firsthand, like me working in a very toxic work environment was having physiological, you know, implications for me and my health, all of those things happening at the same time. It just, it enraged me. I was so upset. I was like, I need black women to know like their people are racist and some of the people you're going to for care don't care about you. And you need to make sure that you're not going to those people. Uh, so it was a mixture of like my anger, my frustration and my rage and my sadness for people who looked like me. And I was just like, I have to do something with this energy. I can't just be in rage. I can't just be angry and bitter and just have this energy for naught. I need to channel it into something constructive and productive. And that is when I came up with the idea for Health and Her Hue. It was literally anger and rage that needed, be to, needed to be channeled into something constructive. I feel like most of my good stuff comes after I'm very angry or feel very passionately about something that needs to change. Um, With Pound, I was Mm -hmm. upset with 
the way that people experienced movement and not everywhere, but in some places, the way that fitness was presented, the pre- pressure that it created, um, the the result was the way we looked at ourselves in a less than positive way. I mean, I think that's number one. So if something makes you upset, if something makes you angry, how do you how do you shift that energy into something really powerful, which is which is what you've done. And I think what you've done is is incredible and I think it'll continue to be. And I, I love the the concept of educating, putting people through um whether it's, you know, educational experiences or getting that badge of approval, that's that's genius and it's simple and it's something that yeah. should be done anyways, right? <laughs> I'm going to call this quick fire like but resources edition because I think I and I said this earlier, the place that we are all at in this world can heavily use more facts, more information and more education. So to start if there is a book or a piece of literature that you would recommend to people listening that might better help them understand the the racial disparities in our healthcare system um, more than what we've chatted about today, what would you what would you recommend? I would definitely recommend um, um, Medical Apartheid. It's written by Harriet A. Washington, who's a science writer. It really breaks down the historical, um, you know, foundation of the racism in our healthcare system and and why we see the disparities that we see present day. So like the past and the contemporary disparities that we're seeing in the healthcare system. Amazing, and we'll make sure to to list that. Um, what what are you currently reading? I'm reading a lot of books about entrepreneurship right now. <laughs> so not many books about healthcare. Um, I was when I had access to academic journals. I'm co- I was constantly staying up to date on research. Yep. Um, now I listen to to podcasts like NPR's Code Switch um, to keep me in the know with like what's going on just generally. But they also have some really great um, healthcare segments. But yeah, right now I'm reading The Messy Middle. I forget the author's name. Um, and it's it's a book about the messy journey of entrepreneurship. So that's that's what I've been tapping into lately. I don't know. I want what's it called? The Messy Middle? The Messy Middle is actually it's written by Scott Belsky. That's the author. Someone um, actually gifted it to me. It was like, you need to read this book because of what you're about to embark on. And I said, okay. And it's like really hard truths that like when I read it, I get scared to read it, (laughs) but because it's, it's really speaking to the reality of the journey of entrepreneurship. What is your, your favorite app other than your own? Hmm. I am, I just discovered this new app called Clubhouse and it's still in beta testing, but I've fallen in love with it now. Um, lots of folks from Silicon Valley, like the investors in Dreesen, um, you know, in Dreesen, and um, folks in the tech space that are on it right now. But it's like this weird mashup of like a podcast experience plus social networking. So you can join different clubhouses, but it's just on audio. So you join in a clubhouse and someone's having a live conversation with other people around maybe a a different, a specific theme. And you can raise your hand and the host of that um, clubhouse can actually bring you into the conversation. So it was almost like listening to your favorite podcast but actually being able to chime in into the conversation with the two hosts or moderator. It's really cool. A friend of mine um, started a company called Quilt, hmm. which used to be uh, essentially that concept, but in person. Uh, so real human connection, but she, she pivoted. It's almost an identical uh, concept and it's, it's more targeted towards women. I'll, I want to put you in touch with her because it's, oh, yes. um, it's very similar and it's such a cool concept. Um, what is your favorite way to move? My favorite way to move? I would say dancing. I like to dance. That's a good way to move. Yeah. <laughs> I miss a good good night out. Yes, same. I'm like, I miss a good day party or boozy brunch. <laughs> <laughs> and you're you're in New York City now, right? Yes, I am. Um, favorite, just if anybody visits in the future, favorite restaurant in New York City? 
My favorite restaurant. Oh, this is hard. Um, but the first one that came to mind is um, Lido. It's a Italian restaurant in Harlem. Yeah. I love it. It's it's like my favorite French place. Last question: uh, If you could leave our community with one piece of advice, what would it be? It would be, um, you know, if there's something or an, a pain point that you've identified, something that's person that you personally experienced that really burdens you, that you should feel activated to address it. Um, one of the things that I always say is that we can see obstacles and failures for what they are at face value, or we can choose to see them as opportunities to improve, um, to correct something in the world or to innovate. And so, yeah, I would just encourage the the community to find that thing that really gets you riled up, whether in a positive way or maybe even in a <laughs> negative way, yeah. and um, find something to create around that energy. That's pretty good advice. Uh, where can our uh, community find you and find health in your hue? Her hue. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I'm on Twitter um, at my full name, spelled how the way I spelled it, A S H L E E Wisdom W I S D O M. I'm always on. I love Twitter, so I'm on there frequently. And then health in her hue. Um, we are at health in her hue on all social platforms on Twitter on um, Instagram, on LinkedIn, and on Facebook. Thank you so much for this conversation. If if I'm being honest, I was kind of nervous. Um, <laughs> I, I think, if I may, with everything that's going on in the world, I just, I always want to be so thoughtful with, you know, my questions and responses. And of course, you never want to say anything wrong, but I think mm -hmm. that's that's not where we're at right in this right. world and it's about having tough conversations about tough topics with people who are courageous enough to initiate and take part in them so i really just want to thank you for for doing what you're doing and and making very significant change in the world through the app through the platform through the educational pieces and the tools that directly serve um, the community i just think it's so incredible so Thank, Thank you, you so for, for everything you do and for spending a little bit of time with us today. I really enjoyed this conversation. I didn't know what to expect. And I actually <laughs> love the fact that, you know, it wasn't really a scripted or planned conversation, but we we're able to be organic and open and just talk with each other. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's the only way I know how. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I appreciate you, you taking it on because I know from the other side of things, it can be hard. You're like, I wish I just knew what they're going to ask me, but it, it's, it is the good stuff comes out of, I think the organic conversations. And that's why, that's why we started the big green couch in, in the first place. And, you know, we are a fitness community and a wellness community, but we're not afraid to have conversations that, you know, live outside of, of, of that. And I think it's made our community uh, a group of people that are are more educated and and more aware of of social issues and things that are going on in the world. So um, we wouldn't be able to do that without conversations like this. So thank you. I love it, and I love that you're using your your platform and your community to to have conversations like these. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Big Green Couch. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on either iTunes or Spotify and to follow us on Instagram at The Big Green Couch.